At about 3 p.m., they recorded 0.5 rentgen an hour. That's almost double the normal annual background radiation dose, absorbed by every human, every hour. They never evacuated people there, he said. The Deputy Minister of Health of the USSR said that the incident posed no immediate threat to the population of Pripyat and the area around Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Why do it here? Hello guys! Today we continue the mini-series that takes a better look at people involved in the Chernobyl disaster. Also, I don't know if you realize that, but this episode is the beginning of the second year of us making these videos. I'm keeping all the plans updated, so I'm happy to say it's 52 episodes behind us, and this is number 53. Happy noises intensify! Thank you for being here with us and for your support. I'm really thankful this channel is growing and that you liked our work so much. You had many questions about different groups or different people, but let me just say that we're now covering the first days and weeks after the disaster happened. We will try to make a video about everybody important to the story, so don't worry that they are not in the miniseries yet. Last time I told you about the radiation measurements done in some particular spots in the Pripyat and Chernobyl nuclear power plant. They were enormously high, yet Moscow didn't decide to evacuate anybody. So first, Let's remind you of what was told in the last episode. At about 3 p.m. they recorded 0.5 rentgen an hour 3 kilometers away from the Unit 4 building, which is 4.66 millisieverts. Just hours later, the reading showed 1.8 rentgen per hour, which meant a day spent there could result in acute radiation syndrome. A healthy adult would then have about 40-50% to 50 chance of dying after acquiring such a radiation dose. Yet, the Deputy Minister of Health of the Soviet Union didn't see the necessity of an evacuation. Why? Today I will explain that. Despite the radiation being so high, the readings were not taken into consideration so far. They were an important indicator of the scale of the disaster, but they were not enough for the government of the USSR. The People of Chernobyl Part 9 High Tolerance for Nuclear Accidents The incident in Mayak plant, known also as the Kishtim disaster, or Ozyorsk disaster, was a result of faulty storage of dangerous materials. On September 29, 1957, almost 30 years before Chernobyl, an underground tank of liquid nuclear waste exploded. It created such a radioactive cloud that today, the thousand of square kilometers of land is now known as the Eastern Ural Radioactive Trace. The plant was a production site of plutonium which was used to make nuclear weapons, but also was reprocessing nuclear fuel. As it was with Pripyat, the city was also something like an Atomgrad, a closed city named Chelyabinsk-40, now Ozyorsk. Regarding the radioactivity released, the Mayak disaster is second only to Chernobyl. On the international nuclear event scale, Ines, it's the only disaster classified as level 6. For example, the Three Mile Island accident was level 5, while Chernobyl and Fukushima were level 7, the highest possible. A particular level is assigned to any nuclear accident because of its size and impact, for example, on population or environment. In Ozyorsk, there were about 10,000 people evacuated, including the population of Chelyabinsk-40 and surrounding villages like Kishtin. The explosion in Ozyorsk was a result of the faulty cooling system in one of the tanks. It contained about 70 to 80 tons of liquid radioactive waste. It failed, and it was not repaired before the accident. The explosion itself was estimated to have a force of about 70 tons of TNT, and it lifted a concrete shield weighing 160 tons. A brick wall of a building 200 meters away from the tank was completely destroyed. 10% of the radioactive substances were thrown into the air and the column of smoke and dust was as high as 1000 meters. The orange-red dust settled on buildings and people, while the rest of the nuclear waste was thrown around the site of the explosion. 
The workers of the plants didn't immediately notice everyone in the area that the contamination reached streets, shops, kindergartens or schools. The railways, vehicles and concrete buildings were all contaminated too. The radioactive substances and dust were brought into the city not only by air, but by wheels of cars and buses. Even the workers brought it there, to shops, homes and other places, just wearing the dirty clothes. Finally, the city administration took action to stop the spreading of contamination, yet the evacuation didn't happen for the next seven days. Now you know what the Deputy Minister of Health meant when revoking the Mayak accident, and what he had in mind. People there were not immediately evacuated and he thought it was a good decision. This is not only the testimony of how the USSR perceived any nuclear accident, but also a grim reality of how high their threshold was. They could wait until the situation was critical and they thought it was a good idea because it could have stopped the possible panic among the citizens of Pripyat. The USSR authorities were mentally prepared for nuclear accidents. They happened before and it was certain they could, and probably will, happen in the future. Before the disaster, there were several incidents in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant itself. There was a series of documents and plans prepared for this kind of event, but they were often contradictory, as a lot of them were written by different people who didn't have access to the other plans. One of the most important ones was a state document named Criteria for Making a Decision on Protection of the Population in the Event of an Atomic Reactor Accident. Long name, many words written, not much of a help. The regulations that were supposed to guide decision makers on when to evacuate people in case of an accident were often contradictory, and there was also a formal trouble. The document didn't point to any person who had a final word in authorizing evacuation. That document also stated that the evacuation should take place only if the citizens were forecast to get a lifetime dose of 75 rem. The safe annual dose for nuclear power station workers was 6 rem, 15 times less than the document said. Because of the formal chaos and fear of making a political mistake, people that could have made the call didn't. Sherbina was a seasoned politician and he was high in the party ranking. He had everything he needed to order the evacuation. Political power, obedient subordinates, support of the scientists in Pripyat, as well as other specialists who arrived from different parts of the USSR. I've spoken a lot about the Soviet need for acclamation and fear of losing face. Often, these two things held back necessary decisions or altered the history of that country. It was the same with the Chernobyl accident. Sturbina was probably not afraid of the panic in Pripyat so much. He knew Soviet people well. He could have suspected that they were so accustomed to the constant news of misfortune and they were so distrustful of any official information that they would not lose their minds if they were warned about the accident. Sherbina was afraid of something more important for any career politician. The state's compulsion for secrecy. That's why there were militia setting up roadblocks early on Saturday, the day of the disaster, which was aimed to seal off the entire area. KGB wasn't waiting any longer. They cut the long-distance phone lines immediately. When Pripyat was being covered in the shadow of Saturday night, no citizen could phone anyone outside the Atomgrad. Soon, no citizen could phone anyone, as the local lines were cut off too. There was no news about the accident besides whispers or gossip. And these information channels were not enough. Nobody told the citizens to stay at home. Nobody told them to seal the windows and doors. Sherbina may have not been worried about the panic, but he knew one thing. If the evacuation was ordered, there was no way of keeping it silent. It was impossible to conceal the exodus of 50,000 people of an entire Atomgrad. Thanks for watching, guys. We're getting closer to the change of subject. Next time you will get another portion of People of Chernobyl, but maybe two episodes from now we will change it to some other miniseries. 
It all depends on how we will manage to keep the story appealing and understandable. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you learned something new. If you have any questions, feel free to write a comment, as always. In the meantime, check out our game Chernobylite or look up our Chernobyl VR tour if you want to feel more Exclusion Zone vibes. That's it for today guys. Take care, stay safe and see you next week.